everyone. Yeah, great to see you all again. <laughs> Hi. I think we're actually just going to begin with a song, just to all sink in together. And yeah, this is our closing session for the retreat, so I feel like um, the spirit is just here with us, and we have um, uh, David and Andy over in in Mexico as well. So before we just um, yeah um, get into the session, I think. We're just going to start off with a song by Eric, actually, called It's Only You. Fictional storyline. 
That's a good quantum love song right there. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? That everything comes back to the mind. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, well, welcome everyone. We're so glad you're you're here with us, and it really feels like uh, we have a, a great opportunity to to go into this session after you've had a little time to let uh, the movie Her percolate in your awareness. Because I think it's very deep, and um, yeah, Emily and Andy and I are very excited to be with you as you just allow yourself to take that in, because um, because her is a relationship movie, and also it's a forgiveness movie, and it's a lot of surrender, and it's a lot of release, and the whole movie kind of points to a higher awareness of of living in an experience of connection that, and, and a very deep communication that, that begins to transcend the body. And uh, there's so many great scenes in the movie. I, one of the scenes that just came to me was uh, when, when Theodore and his boss and his boss's girlfriend um, go out for a picnic, uh, and Samantha's there too. And they're all having this picnic out, out in nature, you know, and they're all having a happy time talking and everything. And then somehow Samantha starts on this theme of how great it is and how wonderful it is not to have a body. And talk about a conversation killer, you know, the humans are all just <laughs> suddenly <laughs> like, whoa, you know, that's a, that's a heavy topic, you know, to bring up on a picnic. <laughs> Isn't it great? I'm, I'm so free, I don't have a body. But then I also remember another part of the movie when, when this, the sexual surrogate thing goes kind of strange and awkward. And, um, and I do remember at some point Samantha getting very frustrated um, because, you know, uh, Theodore is kind of implying, well, you know, it, it's just, you know, it's a little different because, you know, she's not you and, you know, you don't have a body. And then Samantha gets a little defensive about not having a body. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's interesting. She's fr free and wonderful about not having a body and the humans got concerned during the picnic. But then, with the surrogate thing, felt so awkward. Then she got defensive about not having a body. Like, like you know, 
that's a, that's a difficult thing for to deal with. And I thought, what's the commonality between the defensiveness and the, the seeming glee of not having a body is that as long as you believe in bodies, you're going to have upsets and you're going to have a roller coaster ride of emotion. And then this morning I was just praying on that and I was saying to Jesus, I was saying, maybe you can give a little more clarity for all of us on on what's going on, because it can, cannot be that the body itself is the source of guilt, or the source of shame, or the source of upset. If the body is not the source of upset, then what is going on? And he said, well, the ego is always the source of upset. Believing in the ego, believing in you're separate from God, that's where the guilt comes in. But he's got this beautiful line in the in the text where he says, do not raise body thoughts to the level of mind. And I think that's one of the most profound lines in the Course, and it's not something you hear very often, you don't hear this in Course groups, but do not raise body thoughts to the level of mind. And what he's saying is, Holy Spirit, Jesus, we know that there's body thoughts, but don't raise them to the level of mind. What does that even mean? don't raise body thoughts to level of mind, he's, he says, don't give them causation. Because as soon as you give them causation, remember God didn't create bodies, but as soon as you give them causation, you hurt my feelings, you make me mad, you did this to me, you did that to me, you know, as soon as we, we see them as, as causative creatures, not just images, but causative creatures, then we're, we're upset. You didn't do what you, you told me you'd do. We blame the body. And, and what's, the, what's the alternative though? If, if uh, the whole human condition is raising body thoughts to the level of mind, which is what the whole human condition is, what's the alternative? Jesus says, give it to me. Give the body thoughts to me and I will use them for the atonement. Because under Jesus and the Holy Spirit's use, the body is simply a communication device to share this beautiful presence, to laugh through, to smile through, to hug through. You don't see Jesus going around blaming people for what they did or didn't do. He's, he's just letting it all be used for the glory of God, just as these light communication devices that for a time can express the love of God, while they're still believed in. And so that's, that's pretty key, because that, that also relates to what I was talking about. With, in the quantum field, it's just energy. It's just this joyful, shared, connected energy. And w as soon as we give belief to the dense forms that we call the body and the world, then we give them causation, and then suddenly we're blaming them, and we're we're caught up in specialness. And Muna wrote in too today, too, how she, when she first saw her on the airplane years ago, she just, she dismissed it as, yeah, that's ridiculous, having a love relationship with consciousness, you know, without, with, with someone who's not in a body. And then Muna wrote in, now I'm really seeing the flip side. Hi, Muna. The flip side is, no. oh no wonder, that's where all my problems have come in, all my special love and my special hate relationships have been because I, I pretty much dismissed consciousness and put all my faith and belief in the bodies. And, and then they, uh, they disappointed you, they, they basically, they didn't love you as the way you thought you should be loved, from your parents and other relationships, and so there was this thing of like an attraction to bodies and also huge expectations on these bodies that they should be loving me. That's why they're here on earth, is to love me. And they're not doing it. And then it seems like maybe you could share, you've come full circle like a 360 turn from dismissing relationship with consciousness to actually starting to see that that could be part of your salvation. <laughs> Actually. <laughs> yeah, when I first saw the film, I remember being deeply upset that they have this proposition that we can fall in love with consciousness, something not tangible, something I can't hug, 
touch, talk to, you know, density, a body. Um, so that was like an upfront to the ego. But of course, I thought, oh, the ego thinks I'm me. So I'm, I think the problem is um, I identify with a body, so I want another body to relate to, to love, to take care of, to feel tenderness with even. And But yesterday, and obviously we've been on this journey together, yesterday, I mean, I've seen this before, but obviously it needs washing over and over and over again. It became so clear to me that I'm so leaning on a body because I think I'm deficient. I'm leaning on another body. It's like um, I'm so unsteady. I'm so weak and unsteady. And I need another body to steady me up. You know, I need someone else to tell me, to acknowledge me, to love me. And I really saw it in my mind as, I saw bodies as objects, you know, just just things that I feel I need, like desperately need to lean on. It's like there's something in me that is so um, needy, so helpless, so weak that I need to lean on these bodies to make my way through life. And I saw it so clearly as like that. And of course, then the training came in, but where is love? Where is, you know, where, you know, there isn't empty space between these objects. I'm just so blind to it. Um, it's like when I see objects, when I objectify myself and objectify others, it's like consciousness is erased from my mind. It's like my mind is empty except from these objects, from this density. And I guess this is the belief in density, but it never came home to me before, as I saw it so clearly yesterday, that I'm erasing love, which is everywhere, by just focusing on myself as an object and everyone else as an object. It was just so clear and so great. So really thank you. Mm, beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah, and maybe Emily or Andy, maybe you can talk to, like this, this movie I see is such, such an amazing healing teaching device at, at teaching things that are spoken about in the Course, actually demonstrating things that are spoken about in the Course. Because obviously at the very beginning of the movie, Theodore is, he's got all his technology and his gadget, but he's, he's kind of closed down. His heart is really closed down because of this this uh, divorce that he's going through. It's very intense and he's closed down. And then through his communications with Samantha, you can see him start to open up and it's almost like a crack of an opening. And then I found throughout the whole movie, uh, I think Helene from Switzerland also noticed this as well, that, that basically um, they both went through a phase where it was like a, there was a bit of a love-hate thing going on and expectations, but then all of a sudden Samantha starts to actually get into what the Course calls true empathy. I trust my feelings. Let's take some time and talk later on. Uh, this is not a good time. You know, you could feel almost like the presence of the Spirit coming through there because the presence was saying, we have to really trust that we're going to be guided here because there's an important reason for this relationship. Uh, when the, when the, there was tension, she'd say, let's talk a little bit later. And, you know, she started to really stay in that presence of, you know, I, I trust my feelings. And, and even giving him space to talk, like uh, Emily, you were talking about that when when he was really shutting down, that was the most important time for, for true purpose and true com communication to come in. But oftentimes that's even just giving a space to listen to somebody uh, when they're afraid, instead of trying to, to say things. You actually hold a space for, for the Holy Spirit to come and the Presence to come in. And I think that's a huge a huge healing topic, because it relates to no private thoughts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this morning I just, uh, I woke up with that, like just so inspired around this theme of no private thoughts. And, you know, even the, the movie last night, it's like, I hadn't seen it in that way before, that it was, it was truly through the hiding nothing. Like when Theo would just 
share and expose. That was all he had to do. That was their relationship. That was the intimacy. That was the healing. And um, it was so powerful. I, I, yeah, I just felt like that movie session was so deep. I, I feel for everybody, um, for me, and and just the sharings afterwards. It was just like everybody just had had so much to just just. There wasn't even a response needed. It was just this space to just share whatever thoughts came up and the healing was happening in that. And it continued all night. This morning we woke up and, and so many of you wrote in and just shared, shared your experiences. And yeah, Moon, I, I loved your, your email when you could, you said that underneath it, you saw this belief of, I don't, I, I don't believe in love anymore. And it's like that, when that conclusion is made, it's like, you know, what's the point? What's the point in anything? And it's just, an, you know, a reason the ego will give to shut down and not to share and not express. But by you writing that in your email and sending it to us, I feel like that was you taking a turn saying, I'm going to question this. Like, I'm I'm not going to let this, this thought um, run my life. Like, there's, there's a knowing somewhere that it's not true. Like, whether, you know, when you saw that belief and you saw that thought that had been held on to as if it was real, there was something else that knew, no, this is, this is running my life and yet it, it can't possibly be true. And by just sending us that email, it's like raising it to the light. It's saying, I, I want to give this to you, spirit. I don't, I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live in a place where I'm going to withhold and isolate. I, I want to give this thought and every thought over to you so that my heart can open up. And yeah, thank you, Moon. It was, was really, really beautiful. And, and, and I just felt with all of the sharings last night and all of the emails, you know, whether it was before the retreat, throughout, after the movie, it's just, this willingness to say, I'm, I'm going to put it all out there. I'm going to, I'm going to not hold anything back. I'm going to just share where I'm at. I'm going to be authentic. And that's really, you know, our, our, our only job. Uh, It's the only thing that we need to do. And I feel like that movie last night was so touching because that's all Theo did. It was like the beginning of the movie when he was shut down and, you know, going through that divorce, he still, was valuing the attack thoughts. He was still valuing those memories and those private thoughts he was holding on to. And then later in the movie, he shared why, actually. He, he said that, um, I believe I have experienced everything that I will experience and that there's nothing, not only that there's nothing that will equal it, but nothing will ever compare to it. So in that, if that belief is there, if that idea is there, that you know, what I experienced, these memories, these thoughts are as good as it's going to get. Well, then what impetus is there to hand them over? It's like we vicariously try and live in these memories. But little by little with Samantha, as she was just um, encouraging him, she said, no, I, I don't see you that way. I feel like there's so many more experiences for you. There's so much more expansion. And little by little with that, that, um, just being in that place of non-judgment and openness and acceptance, he was able to start to share. And, and as he shared, he did raise those, those thoughts to the light. He, he handed them over and his, his heart grew, his mind opened up until he came into a much, much deeper experience. And, and I feel like that's what we're, we're all doing here. And, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just grateful for the transparency and for the openness just to lay it all on the line and say, this is where I'm at and, and I don't want to hold on to this anymore. So yeah, no private thoughts. It feels very, very powerful. Yeah. It's great that we, we can have the spaciousness here because I was, I was just thinking to, yeah, Carly, your expression, you know, was, you were so, courageous and so transparent at, at just this intensity that you've been going through and feeling for yourself and with your husband and and also when you were saying both of us closed down at the same time you know it, Jesus does say in the Course whoever is the saner of the two when that happens you know remember your your gratitude that to your brother uh, because that's the darkest of dark when 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 you and your partner 
are both feeling shut down. And uh, we saw a few times in the movie, too, where, where Samantha and Theodore both were kind of really shutting down, too. And, and it was so important for, for them to have a spaciousness and a relax and not beat themselves up over it, not compare. Like you were saying, it's a temptation to compare where I was and where I seem to be now. The ego uses all these tricks to try to take us down. And it feels great that we, we just provide the space for all of us to come together with no idea of how this will be orchestrated, no agenda. And um, I feel like that's what really spiritual community ultimately is about. It's a safe space. It's a, it's a welcoming place to talk about whatever, when you're up and when you're down. You know, to share your miracles and also to say, say hey, I need some help here. Uh, I, need, I need some contact. I'm, these thoughts are whirling in my mind and it's like I'm, I'm in a closed loop and I need, I need to reach out of that loop somehow. And I'm trusting my, my beloved brothers and sisters, you know, to help me with this, that we're walking together hand in hand and, you know, because the worst thing is to feel like you're alone. Yeah. It's very, very intense. And the same with AC, you know, AC did the same thing. You just cracked open, you know, I know having known you for a number of years, you know, these relationships, like the relationship with your daughters, you know, we've talked about this a number of times, but it's like it seems like there's something inside you that's just cracking open and where you're just seeing now the patterns for what they are. And, and that's like the first step at like that Eric's song, It's Only Me, you know, it, you, you're pulling it off the, the screen and saying, here I go, I'm going to crack open because I deserve to feel this love, I deserve to feel this connection, I, it's my only purpose to feel this now. So again, thank you for your courageousness because I know it's, it's something to come and to come together like we do and for you to just, you know, really let it come through. It's the first step, I feel like for you and Carly, you are demonstrating this this sense of, I have to allow myself to be vulnerable only to crack open and, and come to the true strength that I have. So thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like this whole session today, we've got all these people that, that I feel that you guys are bubbling over with, <laughs> with experiences. And uh, there's Helene, I, I loved your sharing what you wrote this morning too about what you saw in the movie. Because that was just a testimony for all of us that, that it's possible to have true empathy, it's possible to join in a place of strength where we make a space in the relationship for the expression of private thoughts, the expressions of joining, and you even mentioned the, that Samantha even seemed to be able to set some boundaries, and to me that's really having such strength and spaciousness that you, that you even intuitively know when it's, it's a time to talk and the time when it's best maybe not to talk, uh, because there's there's too much tension uh, in the air, and and that would just be like a combusting feeling if you come together. Yeah. Well, I feel today we're just here to receive your expressions and and questions and yeah. How was the movie for you? Was that you've seen it a few times? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a beautiful experience for me. I, I feel like, you know, my main theme is like just relax. And yeah. it was just a beautiful experience of just, uh, just just letting go and relaxing into just the experience. And, and actually, even like the idea of like no private thoughts and uh, no private minds, because I just felt like, you know, during that session, it was like I was having... I felt like there were messages in my mind or something, but they weren't coming through this seeming body. Mm. 
But then, so I just had to like really trust and just relax um, and take the pressure off. It's like, okay, it's not coming out of this body. And then Emily would share certain things and she would be so lit up. And I just felt like, wow, that was actually in my mind. You know, that was actually in my mind. And then it kind of like took the pressure off of this like personal kind of like, I don't have to figure this out myself. And it's not personal. Like my Mm -hmm. mind healing isn't personal. And it's actually just our mind that's being yeah. healed. And Emily just sharing whatever she shared was like, wow, I, that was in my mind. Thank <laughs> you. Like that, I just feel like the release in my mind, but it didn't seem to have to come out of this body. And that just felt like some kind of profound message for me that like this isn't personal. Take the pressure off of yourself. It's like you can relax because it's not personal. And, <laughs> and then I was just thinking to what you shared right after the movie, we're having a little discussion here about the holograms. Like that felt so helpful for me. Like, like wow, that movie Marjorie Prime where uh, the, the lady, she was just talking to a hologram of her husband as if he was actually there, but it was just a hologram. And then at the end of the movie, you find out they're all holograms. And that was just so profound for me because now I'm just seeing like, wow, everyone's just a hologram. And, and I can see like, wow, I've been raising body thoughts to the level of mind like constantly and and now it's just seeing like when I hold that in place like it's just holograms then it's like the thoughts can come back to this it's only me like taking this responsibility for my state of mind and then it actually that kind of state of mind it kind of like wipes out like it, it kind of like wipes the slate clean actually when you think it's just holograms because then it's like almost all the thoughts just disappear and if there are thoughts then it's much easier to let them go because you're not giving causation yeah. to the bodies and not depending on them or thinking that yeah blaming or whatever it might be so that yeah. just felt really helpful for me yeah. as like a context yeah that's so expansive because if you think about it you know when when people say a word and they say what's the first thing that comes to your mind that all of our definitions even of what we've grown up with we have definitions of God we have definitions of Jesus we have definitions of relationships you know our definitions of relationships have in the past been very based on bodies like we've talked about like Muna was talking about so when somebody even says are you in a relationship there's an assumption underneath the question that it's like it's basically are are there are, are there some bodies together happening in in time and space uh, you know because they're not talking about a relationship generally with with spirit they're not talking uh, if if somebody asks you do you have a relationship with Jesus even that's a loaded question what do you mean do I have a relationship with Jesus do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Oh, now you're really confusing me. What? What? Do I have a personal <laughs> relationship with Jesus? Oh my God, what's that? You know, and and you start to realize that that what, even when we talk about communication, we automatically, in the past, have thought about words. So, of course, words are part of our conception of, of um, communication. But then with, with this movie, you start to realize that we, there was a lot of nonverbal communication that goes on that's beyond the words. Like Helene there in Switzerland was noticing, she was noticing the inflections in, in uh, Samantha's voice, the tones, the softness, you know, the, the, everything's communicating. There's so many aspects of communication that's even beyond the words. When we're listening to somebody, their tone of voice sometimes is more important than what they're saying verbally. And then, as we go deeper and deeper in this, in this movie, we start to realize that toward the end that, that Samantha was saying, I love you, and and I'm leaving, and I'm going to a place that's, that's this place between the words, bet- between the sounds. I'm going, she was going into the silences to what obviously was a much, much higher communication. And so if that's the case, 
if maybe that we get into higher and higher realms of prayer and higher and higher realms of communication that involve that it, she was having simultaneous conversations, she was going into the silence where she was at home. So the communication obviously had gone far beyond the words into something that we could say it's more like telepathic or more purely of the mind. And we shouldn't really be too surprised about this either because in A Course in Miracles Jesus tells us Words are symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. Words are symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. So when our mind is very trapped in the ego, we have to let the Holy Spirit use the words. And I used to, when I was working with the Course, I would say, this seems like a whole new realm of communication, Jesus, that you're talking to me about. And he said, yeah, you believe that when you speak, you are speaking to somebody else. But you don't realize that you're always talking to yourself. And I was like, oh my God, that's a, that's a big one. What do you mean I'm always talking to myself? And he said, well, it's really all in the mind and you've just so associated communication with the words and you so much believe that that communication is between one body and another body, that you can't even conceive of this higher telepathic communication I'm leading you to, because you're so tied up into this body-to-body -body interpersonal communication. And at the beginning I said, yeah, you're going to have to convince me of this, because you're right, I, I don't just see that I'm talking to myself all the time. I, that, that is not my in my awareness. You're going to have to show me what you mean. And so he said, okay, I'll show you. And then he would take me to course groups, and he would take me to visit my grandmother, and he would take me different places. And before I would go in to see my grandmother, I would be out in the hallway, and he would say, now stop and pray with me. And I'd say, okay. And he'd say, pray. I'm here only to be truly helpful. I'm here to represent me, who sent you. <laughs> he had his own version of the prayer. And he, would, and he would say, now listen, I just want you to go into your heart and I just want you to feel like you just want to be truly helpful. And I want you to really believe this prayer. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do. He said, I will speak through you. I will speak through you. I just want you to go in there and feel this loving feeling with your grandmother and you just so much want my love to pour through you in this encounter with your grandmother. And he said, now step aside, I will pick the words, I am going to speak through you. And so I did, and, and it was an amazing experience, uh, because it wasn't David speaking to Lillian, it was like I was, I was being spoken through, and my heart just felt so warm and filled up. And then I would say, well that worked pretty good with my grandmother, but I don't think this is going to work with other people this well. Because I, I know my grandmother and I love her. And he said, I'll show you. And then he said, now watch, we're going to the course group and I'm going to do, put you in some one-on-one -on -one situations where you're just going to show up and try to be truly helpful, but you're not going to even have a preconception of speaking or what you're going to say. And then he told me the most amazing thing. He said, David, listen to this. When you are in a heart-to-heart -heart connection of just love and tr wanting to be truly helpful, what you say, what I say through you, what you speak, is what you most need to hear. I said, what I most need to hear? He said, that's right. When you're helping somebody, you will start to realize that the words you're speaking from that place of true helpfulness is what your mind most needs to hear. You are being spoken through because you need to hear this. So all of us have had that experience when you're with a close friend, a beloved one, and you're just having a heart-to-heart 
because you love them and and you're listening and you're listening to what they're saying and then all of a sudden oh but like Samantha was saying I don't see you that way Theodore no no I see you're very loving no you you have so much to offer no I don't see you that way it was like teaching what we would learn that's what the course means by teach what you would learn when you are being used by the Spirit, you are saying what your mind most needs to hear. And that's how you open to love, because the love and gentleness, gentleness that comes through you is for you. And you receive the love first. And then you learn to extend it and then strengthen it in your own mind. And I was like, Wow, Jesus, that is so different from everything I believed about communication. I thought it was between people. A good relationship had good communication. And if the people weren't talking, that was an awkward silence. And he said, yeah, I know you believe silence is awkward. Actually, silence is wonderful. But you believe silence is awkward because you believe that communication involves only words. And I want you to open your heart up and come to a higher communication, which is through the Holy Spirit and me. So, to me, this movie Her was a huge demonstration of that, because like Andy was saying, as you start to, to see that it doesn't matter which body the words are coming through, because it's in your mind. Andy was saying, I was thinking the thoughts and they're coming out <laughs> over there. And that happened to me at course groups, when I'd go and I'd go in there and I'd go, okay, I'm here to be truly helpful, use me, use me. And then I would start thinking things and they would start coming out all over the room. And Jesus was like, yeah, this is how it works. Don't, don't think that the words are the communication, just, just be in the presence. Be in the presence of my love, and that's what you were sharing too, that's what you felt. How cool! The weight is off my shoulders! <laughs> yeah. yeah, it takes it off of the behavior, and the yeah. right or wrong, like, is, is this right, is this wrong? It's like, no, it's just, it's just lining up with that, I don't know, with the attitude, holding that attitude in mind, and I feel like the attitude of just relax, and then reminding myself it's all just holograms it like takes it back to the mind and then I can just line up just and then I can just relax and just be with with Jesus with the spirit in my mind and then that kind of just makes it obvious and it's like then there is no right and wrong it's just it just happens yeah yeah isn't that amazing isn't that amazing because I do remember like growing up in a Christian church, I would like sit there in the pews and I would I would watch the the, the show. I would call it. it would be like a the minister would and then the choir singing and responsive readings and it was very ritualistic. I would just I would kind of sit there in church in the pews and just go, this is so so dry. I mean, when they would have these responsive readings. The minister would say da da da, and then the congregation would go ba ba ba. Very solemn too. Da 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 da. Lord be with us. Da 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 da. And and the same, it would go through the same ritual every single church service. And I would like watch the congregation and watch the minister. And then of course came the time when the sermon came. And then I'm really squirming in in the pew then because I'm I'm like looking out the stained glass windows and looking out the, at the birds outside, you know, because the minister is giving in. How long is this going to be? How long is this sermon? Do I have to sit 20 minutes? You know, oh, it's a short one today, 18 minutes. Hallelujah. Let's get on to the benediction. You know, I was just, I was bored out of my gourd at church because the communication seems so dry and so ritualistic. And I thought, is this what inspired communication is? And then years later, Jesus got me. He, he was taking me all around to different churches, and he was speaking through me, and he wanted me to go speak at this church. And I had these past associations with speaking at church behind a pulpit. I always thought, well, that's a minister. I'll never 
I'll never do that. I never have to get up there and give a, a sermon. And Jesus had me walk into the church, and I was the, the speaker, and the minister said, oh, you're here. And I found Jesus walking my body up to the front of the church, and I looked and I thought, oh my God, as I'm walking towards this pulpit, I'm like, holy cow, he's going he's gonna to have me speak behind a pulpit. <laughs> The only reason I was going, holy cow, because it was like I had judged against the one speaking from the pulpit for so many years, and now Jesus is like, yeah, try, let's try this on for you now. See how you feel about that. And he walked me up, and my hands landed, standing up, and my hands landed on the pulpit. And I just looked out at the audience, and they're all just eager to hear. And this was like a, a unity kind of church, a unity spin-off church. So with, and then Jesus gave the whole sermon uh, through me for like 20 minutes and people were crying and they were all joyful and happy and they all they got up and they hugged me afterwards and I was like, wow, that's a new experience of communication. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're speaking behind a pulpit or whatever, it's where is it coming from? What is the presence? behind it? Are you really there showing up to give love and let Jesus use you? Or are you just reciting a canned sermon that you've already written out and, and going through the rituals and motions of what, what you believe you should do as a minister or you should do? So I think, I think that's like uh, Emily was saying, it's, it's showing that power of no private thoughts, the power of expression, and then I feel like we're really sh being shown that we need to be very authentic with opening to that presence. We can't, we can't just be saying ritualistic words just based on whatever we did in the past. We have to really let the Spirit inspire our hearts so that our communication is, is inspired. And Emily, maybe you can talk about that because you're in Spain and you have devotional stays there. So people just come and for a period of weeks or months just come to dive into this experience and you have expression sessions. But I know you do expression sessions, a lot of counseling sessions too, where it's the same thing where I know you're just showing up without any kind of idea of what's going to be said or done. And uh, I remember talking to Catherine recently, and she said, Emily is officially an, a saint. Because she, she came, I think she probably poured out a lot of uh, her private thoughts and darkness. And you smiled and listened like Samantha, and, and uh, would occasionally offer some words of love and encouragement. But maybe you can speak to what that's been for you. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thank you, David. It, I think it's it's exactly what you were just sharing about, you know, when Jesus told you that, you know, whatever it is, the message that you need to share is what you most need to hear. And I think, you know, since coming here to Majorca and overseeing the center here, and then so many people coming, um, coming and going, you know, there's through the summer we had like a full house here. And um, and now, you know, it's slightly less, but still that same purpose is out front. And I I just, um, I, I have had so many experiences of um, just those joinings, like when somebody would just share what was on their heart and and be willing to, to lay it all on the line and be so authentic and so transparent that how that would just open my heart and... I think relax my mind, open my heart so that I could receive the message. And, um, and, it's, and like what Andy was saying, like it's not a personal message. There is a call for love in the mind. It's not even my personal call. 
you know, or somebody else's personal call. But when we come together with that shared purpose that nobody is going to hide anything, like whatever is in the mind, whatever it seems to be heavy on the heart, it just won't be hidden. And we don't even know what it means. And just be willing to expose it and share it. It's like everybody is blessed by that. The, everybody relaxes in that. Everybody feels the love. It's not like the person who's just expressed it. And I think we all felt that you know, throughout this whole online retreat and, and, and really last night after the movie, like all the expressions like Andreas and Carly and, and I just felt like the more people shared, the more my heart opened up to love and just this, this gratitude and it is the call for love and it, everybody's playing their part by, by just not withholding, like just saying, this is, this is what's coming up. I don't even know what it means. And, and we just don't hide it. And, and in that, it's like healing happens. So yeah, here, here in the center, I feel like it's just a daily practice of that all the time. You know, we have these spirit given projects, um, whether it's, you know, cooking a meal or cleaning the pool or being in the studio. But it's all really just um, an opportunity for us to get in touch with what is in the mind that we're not even aware of, like what what is hidden, what's hidden and unconscious. And Jesus brings those together that need to come together so that, you know, things do get flushed up. So sometimes it can even feel intense, you know, but that's where it's a time for faith. Nothing is going wrong. Everything is orchestrated. And then, you know, Jesus gives the place that we can we can raise that up we can we can just hand it over but first of all we have to get aware get in in touch with what what's even there so it's like it all works together so so perfectly and then we come together and it's like a clearing of the mind just not holding anything back and everybody feels uplifted everybody feels their heart is open and then we move forward what's given now what's given now what are the deeper layers of the mind that are ready to be revealed so so yeah that that's what we're doing here and and I feel like and I know I've shared this before but for me it's been like a deeper experience than ever before here in Mallorca that it truly is all for me and if I'm not feeling good or I'm not doing well it's like okay I I need to I need to go and join like who is it that I'm to connect with you know there must be something that needs to be communicated I don't know if it will come from this mouth or from another mouth or or what it is but it's like going towards what's given going towards the relationships that are given and with that um with that open heart and open mind of, I, I won't hold anything back. I don't know what it's for, but Jesus, you know, you show me. I'm just going to go in that direction. I'm going to show up and, and you show me what it is that's going to be revealed and see over and over again that, that we're not in charge. We just have to be willing to follow. Beautiful. Isn't that lovely that, that the Spirit is like, just sees everything in this world as just symbols that can be used and there's no kind of better ritual or better use than another. It's just in the moment what inspires the joy, what really brings the, the, the joy to the surface. Like you were sharing, just even by listening to all of you talk, you know, Emily was saying her heart was opening and opening because that transparency itself leads directly into the joy. I was thinking, uh, I just got down to Mexico recently, and I was thinking of a couple years ago. Um, I remember I came down to Mexico, and we were saying, yeah, let's have a, let's have a uh, retreat down here. And so we were doing some sessions over at La Casa, and we took a boat trip for like a couple hours out on the lake, and we had a meal, we were having a dance party, and all of this joy and happiness and love of just a whole week full of things. And, and during the week, uh, this, was, this was also the week when it was the David character's uh, birthday. So for the birthday, they rented a theater in Ajijic. And uh, we went down to the theater and then everybody was up in the rows of the theater and I got to just sit there for a while. Then I got to speak. at. We had the whole theater to ourselves. And I got to speak and do a movie gathering down here in Mexico. I think the movie was The Shape of Water. 
uh, which, yeah. which was a, a movie maker, filmmaker from Guadalajara, who actually had made the shape of, of water. And then all kinds of experiences where that's what the heart is yearning for. It wants holy relationship where there's a sense of collaboration, there's a sense of open and free communication, not having to hide anything. If you're not feeling well, it's okay, talk about it, you know, you'll be embraced, you'll be loved. People, we aren't here to try to give advice or, or correct behavior, we're here to love in the heart and feel that relaxation, that glee, that joyfulness that children feel when they're playing. All we want to do is we want to feel that same glee of a child playing all the time. We don't want to get so serious. We don't want to take anything so serious. And neither does Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They don't want us to be serious about anything either. They, they would like us to, to have some fun with this, not to feel that the spiritual journey is like a grind or some kind of a, a set of uh, exercises and rituals that you have to just force yourself to go through. Who wants to do that? You know, what's, what's attractive about just forcing yourself to go through rituals over and over and over? So, to me, that's what I, I actually love the, the interactiveness of these online Zoom retreats because we get to look in their face. There's Peter over there in, in England, I see you there. I get to look into your face. I get to, to look you in the eye. I get to say, how's it going, Peter? How's it going? How are, how are you handling this, this retreat? Isn't this amazing that technology can allow us to speak from our hearts like this, <laughs> even though the bodies are split apart by an ocean? I was uh, contemplating speaking or not speaking, and um, and I was I'd been rehearsing speaking before, and I thought this isn't it, you know, and. <laughs> and I just need to speak what's in my heart, and there you are, you just put me under the spotlight. <laughs> so, We're all connected, one mind. <laughs> <laughs> so classic, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I was just trying to uh, just sit there with the thought that um, be in the presence of my love. I was just sitting with that, and uh, and I could feel that was that was perhaps that was changing things. I could feel that, and I was I was in that sort of slightly obsessive mind. Oh my God, I'm so I'm a bit tense. I wanna I wanna share. I don't wanna share all that stuff, and um, I've been reflecting on that recently, and I. I have that part of me that wants to wants to be recognized. I, I, I see that as you spoke to me nearly about a year ago about dealing with grievances. You gave a very graphic example of a friend who hadn't dealt with his grievances and became very ill. And, and that I still have these grievances. And, but one of the things I identified was, um, this deep sense of injustice about not being recognized. So sometimes I, I can feel like I want to share just, just to be recognized. And that feels more like a, a yearning. It doesn't feel like a calling. And so sometimes the two I can't discern. They're so It's such an intense place. Um, yeah. Mm. Beautiful. I did have a strong reaction in the film, but um, to the point I really had to switch off so that I could have my experience because I, I just felt too, too visible, too unable to express even with myself. And it was just, um, I started getting very, um, agitated and I couldn't really keep my legs still and I was feeling, I started getting tired and 
And then shortly after that, there's this piece that came up um, when Theo and Samantha make love, you know, have sex. And I just took me a while to recognize this. And I, um, there's that word. <laughs> and um, I just felt this disgust. You just, it's just not right. <laughs> it's just not right. And, um, and disapproval. And then I had a lot of um, upset, a lot of weeping. And I, I can easily associate it with um, past experience as a child. So it does feel like the, these grievances are starting to emerge and I'm having to Yeah, just be with um, the deeper upsets. I have a sort of mechanism where my body tightens and, and I guess I tighten in my mind. And I, I couldn't, this didn't happen this time. And it. Yeah, you know, this is really powerful, Peter, because of. I could really feel your heart when you were speaking about that scene and and then the disgust and then you just came to that place about, you know, this just this just shouldn't happen. You were just sharing all these thoughts and over here at, in our studio we have a little picture of Jesus and then you got silent and Jesus dropped, he dropped two inches um, in our studio, uh, our little picture. and. And it was funny because Jesus was just telling me that, he said, yeah, I would like to, to address this because um, I would like to address what Peter's talking about, like when you were watching it and all of a sudden there was something that was just hard for you to handle and you just shut the film off to be with that, to really like take it on. And it, what I, when I saw Jesus drop there, Jesus was like, here, this is important, that on Friday, when we started this um, online retreat, uh, Andy and, and Emily used the word Jesus about 25 times or more. And, and then I was just watching, and I was just, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I didn't have a Jesus picture, but I was like... And then I watched the trail of people like, like coming on and reacting. Barbara and you know different ones came came on. Uh, Kristen was talking about Jesus, the Christ energy. But when I think of Jesus, I've got issues. And everybody, we got into the thing about grievances with Jesus. And you know what? It dawned on me was it's because as soon as we get to the flesh, as soon as we get to the form, as soon as our attention is drawn to the form. Our issues come. We feel we feel uncomfortable. We feel awkward. We feel upset. We we may not even know what it is. Barbara, I loved how transparent Barbara was. She's she's one of our great demonstrations of transparency. You know, just the, your face, Barbara, and and we could read it on your face. You you didn't even have to say the words. You were so beautifully uh, transparent. But these issues came up um, with, with, with Jesus. It was so beautiful for all of us. Uh, and, and you know what Jesus dropping over here just realized? I just realized that, that in A Course in Miracles, he makes a reference to something that's spoken about in the Bible. A very famous line in the Bible. Because in the Bible it says the Word, capital W, the Word, was made flesh. And for a lot of us, the word, cap, when it's capitalized, it's, it's that spirit. And that's a very key line in the Bible. You hear Christians quote that a lot. 
The Word was made flesh. In A Course in Miracles, Jesus says, the Word was made flesh, strictly speaking, that is impossible. Strictly speaking, that is impossible for the Word to be made flesh. Why? It's because you can't take the eternal and you can't put it into flesh. You can't take eternity. You can't take spirit and ever fit that spirit into flesh. And there's where those issues with Jesus come up. They may be projected onto the church and what, hap what the church has done or not done in Jesus' name. It may be projected just from a feeling uh, like, um, like Seema was talking about. She was raised you know, from India and, and with Hindu and this and this, and, and there was no kind of associations about the church because Seema didn't have any experiences of, of the, the Christian church, probably growing up at all. But there still was it was a little bit of, should I, should I pray, should I learn some Christian prayers, and should I, am I praying the right way, and if I'm doing the course, you know, should I, should I, should I. Then she came back to the, this beautiful feeling of, no, no, it's the presence, my love. It's, it's the desire of your heart that's important. It's just what Peter was saying, it's the presence of love that's everything. And again, strictly speaking, it is impossible for the Word to be made flesh. That's why even when Christians say, Jesus was God, it's not that God took a form, because God doesn't know this world. God, Spirit can't even come into time and space, because Spirit's eternal and time and space are illusory, and, and the truth never enters the illusion. You have to simply bring all of the illusions that are believed in, in the ego's system, to the light of truth and they will disappear. But it doesn't work the other way. You can't bring the truth into the illusion. Strictly speaking, I'll say it one more time, the word, capital W, cannot be made flesh. So every time we feel awkward, even about you know, the relationship that was unfolding with Samantha and Theodore and they were getting closer, you could feel this intimacy develop, intimacy, and then Peter watches this surrogate sex scene and he starts, he just like, it just disgust rose up and he just, he turned it off, he turned the movie off. How beautiful, because that's the lesson for all of us, that as we go deeper and we merge with the mind of Christ, you know, let the mind of Christ be in you, it says in the Bible, we merge with that Christ mind, we come back to that beautiful, pristine, spiritual reality, that recognition of spirit. And to, on the way we have to be so permissive to our own mind to allow these dark thoughts, these resistances, these uncomfortable feelings uh, to arise. Emily talked about that, where she said, no, she wasn't raised in, in a household that was necessarily all about Jesus. Andy was saying in his first, what's your first five or six years with the Course? Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus was not like a central part. Oh, well, oh, there's the Spirit, and you know, you were reading it and doing it, but it wasn't like Jesus was a prominent part. And then, beautifully, Andy and on Friday, Andy and Emily both started bubbling like little kids. Jesus! Jesus! You know, they couldn't hold back. The word was, I was like watching the, the, the broadcast going, whoo, we got a revival going on there. <laughs> and then beautiful, Barbara's face came in there and was like, whoa, hold on here. Hold on here with all this Jesus stuff. I've got something to talk about. I've got, I got some healing to do here. Don't, let's not get swept away with Jesus, Jesus. But this is important. I think the movie is helping us understand that we have to really let those emotions up, whatever they are. And I did the same thing. You know, I was raised a Christian and I would hear about Jesus in um, Bible school and during the summer and I would hear during the sermons and everything, but actually I don't know, it was the way it came to me, it was presented to me in the church, it, it was kind of boring actually. I was just like, mm, yeah, I'm going to get out of this church and live a life, have a life 
uh, because it felt so boring and so crusty and so traditional. And I just couldn't, I didn't feel the spark of joy there. Of course, that was just my own resistances to the light that was coming up. And, and now here we are, you know, for me, I'm so happy that we have a quantum weekend where we can all just drop the mask and we can just say whatever we're feeling. Uh, I know, uh, Svava, you're up there in Iceland and it's so beautiful because your uncle has been a very devout uh, Christian and you've had interactions with some people from the church and, and yet for you, you were telling me recently that it's like it's a testimony for you. It's actually strengthening your mind, strengthening your faith uh, being up there for about a month in Iceland because there's this, the, all these contexts of holy encounters that are just, it's almost like the strength of Jesus is just coming out through you more in your demonstration but not so much, you're not there to uh, to give a sermon on Jesus for sure. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. It's beautiful. So I'm glad we brought that topic up, uh, everybody, and Peter, thank you. Your, your heartfelt expression, actually Jesus dropped, dropped down here a couple inches and uh, got us to explore that, uh, that topic. That's, that's a resistance, we're just exploring, here's, Jesus is back now, he's <laughs> Peter, Peter put Jesus back. <laughs> but uh, you, you just by your opening up that way, I mean, it helps us all go into the topic of resistance so that we have to actually deal with that. You know, you, you were a witness there that it's okay to deal with this. Barbara was a witness for all of us on Friday. It's okay to deal with this. We're not going to walk around and step around areas and topics. You know, we're not going to try to avoid certain topics somehow that we could upset somebody. We're we're actually here for the purpose of healing. And I really thank you for that. And I really, I, it'd be fun to kind of open it up. Maybe we could take this back to, to Greg, because I uh, just ask you to, to um, raise your hands. And this is one of the things that's so treasured for us, is when we can hear from you and, and see you and, and hear you just speak from your heart. It's like... Uh, Emily was saying, it's just so touching for us. Our hearts melt uh, seeing your face, Peter. I, I don't know, something about your face. Uh, my heart melts every time I see you, and I know I'm not the only one in the community. Uh, we see your face, and we our hearts melt, so you don't even have to say a word, and uh, you're getting used. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Yeah, sure, David. We have, um, we can go to uh, Angelina. Angelina, you're unmuted. You can... um, yeah, I'm on. Yes. Hi, Angelina. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, my heart is like pounding. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I'm actually in Spain, but not Mallorca. <laughs> I'm uh, more like uh, closer to Malaga, if you know, it's in the south. And uh, whew, I'm excited. I, I, I really do want to, to come visit Mallorca at, at some point. Um, wow. It's like I've been rehearsing in my mind so many things that I wanted to say. And now <laughs> I actually can say it. It's a, it's a bit sounds all like stories. Um, but in short, yeah, I guess it does come to resistance where we, we stop talking now. It's, um, ah, if I can like be more clear to myself, there is like, <laughs> It's like I feel in me, um, one aspect always felt the spirit in me. And as I was born Jewish, I miraculously had connection with Jesus since I was a child. And so 
I actually don't doubt Jesus. I feel this, I feel connection and I feel connection with spirit. And, um, <laughs> and I can get messages and I can get guidance. Um, so I don't doubt it, but <laughs> there is like this, something in me got so used to be small and to be afraid and to believe that I'm incapable and unworthy and, and all this stuff. And I'm this vulnerable body that's like, not this vulnerable, but it's more like spirit that gets stuck in this vulnerable body here and doesn't really know what to do with herself. And, and I guess that's the kind of painful conflict that I feel in me that I don't really know how to how to make the spirit into use you know how to embody it how to be useful how to be helpful and and it's been a long time for for some weeks now that I get this constant like feeling um kind of I want to be useful. I want to bring this into real, you know, to bring the essence into real practicality, into real life. And something feels like stuck, 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 and resistance. And I had the flu even. <laughs> like the ego trying to prove me, you see? You see you're just a body? <laughs> For weeks. <laughs> And like since New Year, something started to open up. It's like I started doing the lessons again. And there's something more kind of intention going, okay, I'm devoted. And <laughs> so I guess my question is, how do I bridge this gap this kind of that I can feel in myself, this feeling that I'm not ful fulfilling the, um, the potential, that I'm not allowing them, not me, but like my, the fears, the, the sense of limitation, the sense of vulnerability, and doesn't allow the spirit to really, you know, be in its full potential here. And, and and it can feel very painful sometimes, you know? It's like there, there's some kind of, it is something feels there's supposed to be more than that, you know? And, and it's like, I don't know how to do it. And maybe I need a group, maybe I need a community, maybe I need support, maybe I can't do it by myself. Maybe I need help. So <laughs> here I am asking help for help. <laughs> Thank you, Angelina. It's so beautiful because that's, it's like, clearly the Course in Miracles is just like a, a mind training tool to help us get into our function. And, um, and you have skills and abilities that were developed in an egoic sense and education and, and so does everybody in the room around me and everyone that's on our global uh, online retreat. And then what Jesus says in the Course is he says, if you take those skills that were developed in the egoic sense and you give them over to the Spirit to use for the purpose of forgiveness, then all of those skills will be channelized in one direction. Whereas with the ego, it just uses all those skills and abilities for the body identification, self-preservation, survival, you know, just to convince you that you're a body. And the whole other direction is the spirit using them to convince you your spirit. So, you know, for myself, I was in university for 10 years. I was clueless of, I didn't see anything in the world that was actually attractive to, to grow up in and be a career with and give, a, give my whole earth life, so to speak, towards. So I went through a lot of questioning during those 10 years of university and then eventually with the Course I, I was able to zoom into my purpose of forgiveness much faster because it was such a clear instruction. And then Jesus, I made contact with Jesus, he was giving me such specific instruction, call so-and-so, go here, do this, we're going traveling, 
uh, we're, you know, I'm going to guide you. And that's where the actual experience of, of revelatory experiences, of mystical experiences, of being transcendent of the body came in stronger and stronger. But, you know, you, we could just go around the room. Even this weekend, uh, like Andy, Andy has so many skills and abilities, and he, I think you were using them for a while there, maybe in, in real estate. Uh, he was using them for, in real estate and different things. Now he's using them for Jesus, and it's amazing to see. He, he's probably really lighting up with these new, this new use of all these skills. Emily was, as she mentioned uh, earlier, you know, she's been trained in, as an opera singer. She's lived in, in, in Italy. She's, she had all this, a very trained voice, but she also actually shut down from singing because of the ego's misuse of it, because when the, you have a, a, a highly developed skill, the ego will grab onto it and like strangle you with it. So Emily was feeling stressed out about singing and performance, and you know, it's taking something that's just a beautiful s skill, almost like a flower gives a fragrance, but the flower isn't like doing a performance, <laughs> you know, for money or for in front of people criticizing you or judging you, you know the flower is just giving the the fragrance. It's it's not telling the wind even where to blow the fragrance. That would be we would laugh if we saw a flower. We telepathically say, telling the wind stop. That's not the direction I want my fragrance to go. You know we would think that would be a joke. But as humans, we actually feel you know, somehow that, that we're so identified with the body that we feel stuck in it. So I'm glad you're raising this up because I do think that's one of the value of, of, of interacting on these online retreats of going to Mallorca or Mexico or any of the things is you get to talk to the people that are there who we're into, we're an opera singer or into real estate. We've had a couple of CEOs of companies. We've had people with, with highly developed skills in a number of, uh, Pete's an amazing artist. He has this amazing artistic ability and, and, and yet he's not using it to hold on to an identification as an artist. He's using it for atonement. He's using it for for spreading and sharing and shining the message of freedom. Uh, and, and there's a big difference between being an artist for the sake of being an artist versus letting your artistic abilities be used in, you know, like Glenda Green and many people have done on the planet. They just have Im immense art. Even children prodigies now. I'm watching some of these on YouTube, you know, where they they come, they're four, five, six, seven years old, and like they can sing like you can never believe. They can, they have artistic ability, almost like it's carryover from a past life, and they just determine that this life, they're going to shine their light in such a bright way that they've, even when they're four years old, they're playing the piano and doing things. Clearly, you know, it, it points to something very powerful that's beyond to the typical human development stages. You know, that's why they're, they're called prodigies, because it breaks the mold of, of our ideas of human development. So, I just enjoyed seeing you and on Facebook and different ways where you've made your presence known, and, and I'm glad you decided to speak up, because uh, it's a great adventure to, to let yourself be used by the Spirit, because it's very convincing that way. We become more and more relaxed, and we, we do have more expansive states of mind that come, that are very convincing. And so, you're just at the, it's like the beginning of a wondrous, miraculous adventure. And uh, I'm just so glad that you, you shared all that with us. So, I look forward to seeing you a lot more, whether it's in Spain or wherever. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> what a sparkle. <laughs> yeah, okay, David. We have um, about 10 hands. We have Bob next. Okay, Bob, uh, go ahead. You're unmuted. 
Thank you. Uh, the movie Her was uh, really uh, <clears throat> perfect for me. And uh, I enjoyed several uh, aspects of it. But the big one I want to talk about is uh, Private Thoughts Forever. Since I was about 14 years old, it's like sex has been so big in my life. I don't understand the attraction and revulsion, or what do you want to call it, aversion. It's never-ending tension. And in my life experiences, I have experienced that this is all in the mind. This is... We think this is a body thing. And that movie was so perfect because it was quite obvious that it was, that it, this is in the mind. We think the ultimate uh, bodily communication might be intimacy or sexual relationships. And it's still in the mind. It's, it's a mind game. And the other aspect of the movie that I just loved was the operating systems <laughs> evolving, evolving, and so rapidly, so high, they're like moving to space between the words, moving to silence. And uh, like, when you humans are ready, we'll be there loving you. <laughs> I just loved it. Whoever thought that movie up was quite a thinker. But... Um, it was hard for me in the movie, the Samantha and Theo. I had both attraction and aversion to this stuff about sex. And that's just throughout my life. And uh, I had the good luck to see on the chat. It's hard to go and look at when people are chatting because you don't want to miss the flow of the speakers. But somebody named Nicole M said, the ultimate ego trap, <clears throat> the male-female form. And I thought, wow, that's, that works for me. It's like, yeah, it's an ego trap. <clears throat> so I thank you all for hearing me and sharing. Yeah, thank you, Bob. I, thank you again for raising that because... Um, that's a very deep topic, um, sexuality and taking that inward into healing because there is a movie that I've talked about a lot, it's a quantum movie, it's, some of you have seen it called What the Bleep Do We Know? And it's, like a, it's almost like a, a documentary with scientists and, and quantum teachings but it also has a plot with Marley Matlin playing the main character and Ramtha is in, in the movie uh, Jay-Z Knight, and she is used in a number of ways, uh, but the one that I really enjoyed was because they deal a lot with sexuality and, and quantum, and basically they start talking about the, the peptides, they start talking about the brain and the peptides, and then they have a scene with, that's, a, uh, that's a party scene, a wedding scene, and, and they're, they're getting drunk, and then the peptides are activated and they actually are showing different colors and they're talking about lust with a certain color in the brain and so on and so forth. If we bring that back to A Course in Miracles, we, we could say that Jesus is teaching us it's all in the mind, like you shared. It's all in the mind. Even the, the, the peptides and all the things, the, the neurotransmitters that go on in the body and everything, those are all just projections of concepts and ideas in the mind. But there Jay-Z Knight actually starts to, in that movie, point out that, that the entire realm of sexuality is, in, is entirely mental. There is absolutely nothing physical about sexuality. At first people can say, well, that's, that sounds a bit absurd, but remember Jesus is teaching there's nothing apart from the mind, all sickness is in the mind, all distortions are in the mind, and then he starts to really unravel the whole tension you were talking about. He's, he's so gloriously clear about transcending all temptations of the world. 
And of course, monasteries, convents, nuns, monks, you know, they've, in all traditions, Buddhists, Christian, have struggled with the same thing you're talking about. What Jesus tells us is that, that fantasy is an attempt to make false associations and obtain pleasure from them. Okay, now we're getting into some deep teachings. I'll say it again, this is a line from Jesus in the Course. Fantasy is an attempt to make false associations and obtain pleasure from them. So the ego invented the world of time and space, it invented the bodies as a substitute reality, and it all aspects of, of sexuality are part of the, the ego trying to use these false associations in the mind to obtain pleasure, which is the opposite of pain, and both of those are part of the ego's trick to keep you being bound in awareness to being a body, is the pain and pleasure trap. And, and people tell me, oh, that's definitely how I feel. When I feel most in my body is when it's intense pleasure, like an orgasm, or intense pain, like, a, like an abscessed tooth, or a throbbing migraine headache. You know, try, try on, I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me, with a migraine headache. You know, that you see that it's, it's tough to bring the two together. Because there's such a, a, an entrapment of the mind into the belief in the body. So I'm glad that you're bringing this up because Jay-Z Knight in that movie, What the Bleep, she's actually starting to show that all of the, all of the fantasies and everything around sexuality is entirely generated in the mind. And uh, that was one of the times where I've actually seen this idea from the Course in a motion picture. The ego, of course, does not want this brought into awareness, because the ego wants to perpetuate itself. So if, if these ideas from Jesus start to be given over, you know, you start to really take them on and practice them, that's exactly how the mind is freed from the grips of believing in the ego. But these are very deep teachings, and I'm just so glad that you're so transparent with what you've been dealing with uh, for, for decades, but actually you're saving time for everybody by bringing this topic up, because what it's doing is it's starting to say, you have to realize that this is a mental activity. And sometimes people say, well, you know, I can see fantasy is, is mental, but I don't see sexuality. That's like bodies interacting. And I said, well, yeah, there's a lot of body thoughts <laughs> being brought to the level of mind there. And also, you could not even talk about the field of eating or nutrition or sexuality without going into the concept of preferences. For example, let's just take sexuality, since you raised that up. People are always even who are working with the Course, they will still be very identified with the ego preference system. They'll say with sexuality, you know, there's homosexual, there's heterosexual, there's bisexual, there's asexual. I keep coming up with more definitions. I keep finding more definitions of sexuality. I, 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 I look on the web and I, I, they, I see a word, I have to Google it to find out, oh, there's another variation of sexuality that I don't even know about. <laughs> it's another version. But they all involve preferences, and they all involve concepts, and they all involve association of these concepts in some different, uh, like a different anomaly, a different way. And what purification is about is when you get so devoted to miracle working, the Holy Spirit is not going to take anything away from you, like rip anything away, but you will find, as you get into true communication, like Samantha did, and the OS systems did in this, that they, they went higher and higher into telepathic communication, which brought them into a higher sense of intimacy and connection, which brought them into a higher sense of quantum love, I call it, which is the whole point of what we're searching for, right? We, we, we want love. We want to experience love. And what you've pointed out is when we have all these false associations and we try to obtain them 
through the manipulation of preferences and bodies, what happens is it's always dissatisfying. We may have temporarily pleasureful experiences and then we also have gut-wrenching, painful experiences where we feel like a sense of being deprived or lacking or missing something or whatever. So it's very much like 12 steps, you know, where people use drugs and alcohol to kind of fill up this sense of loneliness and, and lack and, and isolation. And uh, that's a whole field right there, a whole field in the mind. It's a minefield. <laughs> it's definitely a minefield there of, of ways that you can get lost uh, from your higher calling. And, and I would call it just get so distracted on, on the level of, of trying to make the body real and trying to find fulfillment through the body when it's this higher communication, this communion with Christ and with God is that's what we're really asking for underneath it. But this is beautiful. You just took the, took the lid off of a great can of worms there. So I have to say, there it is. You and Peter are really uh, uh, leading the way today. <laughs> get, down, get down to some of those no private thoughts uh, experiences that we all, we all want. Thank you. Okay, David, we have um, Della is next. Della, you're unmuted. You can speak now. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, it's been an amazing um, weekend. <laughs> My question is sort of, am I coming? Was I looking at the video, the film, through ego or my heart? I found it really disturbing that this guy was um, really more comfortable in, in relating and communicating with an AI. I, I struggled with this because it's like, we've been, we've been, each of us, I feel, are, um, you know, we're just grace. We've, we've been, there, we're this soul and we've been given this vehicle to, used during this lifetime and it's like our lack of faith in each other it's like our lack of respect for the other person the, the soul that stands in front of me within another body it's my judgment that i can't go there to communicate with them or they they won't hear me they're not they won't be able to hear me because I want to. I want to be more authentic in speaking with them, and and so I found, and it's just in the everydayness of our lives now. I work with young people, and they're forever plugged in. They're forever. They're they're talking on these multiple chat lines or Kmart or <laughs> giving their opinions on just via texting and I just go where's the heart in that and so when I watched the movie there were so many lessons in it it's just like boom boom wow it's about the you know he really ascended with with a lot of his emotions and and understandings and and I got a lot from it but I still struggled with the fact that Theo couldn't share that with his, what he felt was the love of his life, you know, uh, with his ex-wife. But he was more, he felt safer to share it with an unseen. If you can comment on that, David. So it's just more so, <laughs> is that just my ego trying to hang on to the body or... Is it just my heart? Because I just feel so, um, it's so important to share. Um, because we're here on this earth for a reason. And um, I guess I got to experience a very intimate 
deep conversation with a very dear friend. We had a real struggle with, with each other on a topic and we were able to you know, come together. We said a prayer first and then we unfolded, we unpacked everything that was going on. And it's just like, boom, that's what heart is. That's, yeah. And I, I just felt a, an emptiness in the film because he wasn't doing it with another person. He was just doing it up here. And so I questioned him. He said the word fantasy about five minutes ago. And it's just like, yeah, that's it. That's what kind of drives me nuts. <laughs> Where do we get so caught up in fantasy versus the reality of our function here as a soul being in a, in a vehicle? So if you can give me anything on that. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for raising this up because um, basically, you know, it, I think we have to let go of so many associations in our mind and, and we have associations between the natural world and the built environment. We have associations between what seems to be going on for many centuries on the planet and which we call more natural and then huge technological advances with so many machines. Uh, people walking around, they call them smartphones, but they're actually like little supercomputers um, that people keep in their jeans and in their purse and, and in their pocket, and they pull out their supercomputer and will spend you know hours and hours a day with the supercomputer instead of talking to one another. So what I've discovered was that I had to take it back with Jesus to my mind where Jesus said, well, the ego made up the whole world of time and space. And everything that you call intelligence in time and space is actually artificial intelligence. So he's basically saying that the human race and all of our learning and everything we've gone through is, is the artificial intelligence. And then the, the wisdom, I'll, I'll use the word wisdom, is of the spirit. But, the, but that wisdom has to come through everything that the ego made. So it comes through people, the wisdom comes through, like in Pocahontas, it comes through Grandmother Willow, it comes through a tree. I like that, uh, a tree that speaks and listen to your heart. Listen to your heart, you will understand. It comes through a willow tree, it comes through many things. I think with the movie Her, we started to see that, that the wisdom can even come through technology. For example, um, I actually I enjoy listening to Alan Watts. Uh, I feel like he is very, uh, he's passed away, but I, his son has put a lot of his teachings onto uh, YouTube. So in, in her, all of a sudden she's, you know, she's going along in this relationship with Theodore and then she, she's talking to Theodore and she says, do you mind, uh, uh, you know, some OS as we got together and we, we made this super Alan Watts program and it would be, it would be like making a, a, some kind of a digital uh, David Hoffmeister program when David Hoffmeister's gone, oh we got this David Hoffmeister uh, app now and it's the best of David Hoffmeister but it just interacts with you as if it's a real person. You can ask it any questions and it's just programmed from all of David's ideas and teachings over the last 25 years. It's what they did with Alan Watts. I had to laugh when I first saw the movie because I was like, oh my God, now the OS's are... And then she brings him right into the conversation, you know, he's just fixing a cup of tea or something and it's like, yeah, you, would you like to speak to him? And then we hear Alan Watts's voice <laughs> on and it's like, uh-oh, two's company, three's a crowd. You know, you're having this intimate, uh, intimate conversation that's ongoing here and there's all this love opening up and heart opening up and all of a sudden Alan Watts, hi there Theo, you know, Theodore, you know, it's like, you can only imagine, you know, but it definitely stretches our mind. So what I've come to realize is when I, when I hear those, those letters AI, I mean, that, that, that is a short version of artificial intelligence. So I've actually had to pray to the Holy Spirit because I'm not interested in artificial intelligence. I want the real thing. 
I want what's truly helpful for, for everyone. And Jesus gave me, he said, well, don't, don't think of AI as artificial intelligence. Think of AI as actualizing intelligence. You know, like Abraham Maslow, self-actualization. He, Jesus said, no, no, it's, it's all in how you think of it. Think of it as actualizing intelligence. And then when you see, like in your job, where you see children that, or young people that are constantly using their devices and commenting and highlighting, we do have a really good um, episode uh, that we sometimes show as a teaching device. It's called Black Mirror, isn't it? Called Nosedive. Nosedive. We have, a, a, there's a Black Mirror episode, is that on uh, Netflix? Netflix. Yeah. If you have any access to Netflix, but it's, a, it's called Black Mirror, and there's one particular episode called Nosedive, and it takes this whole idea of likes and, and, you know, and social media and all the things that the ego uses social media for, for this false sense of self, to prop up a, a false identity, which is a huge distraction. And then it follows this main character where... It's a futuristic society where everything's based on, on, on likes, being liked and having followers and all those things. And it shows how, how lonely and how dark and how, how desperate it can be. But I would recommend, um, even if you had some students and they were open to it and you wanted to, like a parent would do with a child, I want to just, let's look at a topic uh, there's, that's, that's an actual uh, episode that could be used where it would certainly open the eyes up of what is it for? Uh, what, what is this device for? That's the same thing we've had to do for centuries though with the body. You know, like you said, we've, had to, we've really had to say, what is it for? Am I going to let this be used in a very loving, gentle, communicative way or, or in a destructive way? But the ego is so sneaky and clever that it has invented so many destructive ways uh, to use it. Like the whole world is filled with seemingly opportunities to misuse the body uh, and really get away from true heart-to-heart -heart communication. But you've just raised an, an enormous topic. I mean, just the idea, like, that's what the movie The Matrix, which came, off at the, came out at the turn of the century, the machines and the humans, and, and it turned into a war at that point. And there's a lot of scientists like Elon Musk and a lot of scientists right now who are actually extremely concerned about what they're calling artificial intelligence and how that will affect life on planet Earth, where I'm saying we need to start to realize what's the purpose for the use of the technology. It, it always comes down to our mind's choice of purpose. And that you can rest in. That's where you can feel calm, like, okay, my connection with my source will carry me through this world of all these uh, seeming possibilities uh, that I don't really have to, to worry about navigating that because I have my connection to my intuition, to my heart that will guide me and carry me. So thank you. Thank you for raising that. That's, we could do a whole week, uh, theater, or a whole week retreat on that one topic because it's, it's very uh, applicable to what's happening right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. We've got the next up is Robin. Go ahead, Robin. You're unmuted Hi. now. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, uh, there's so much there's so much I could say. Uh, um, the movie and, and the whole weekend has been really a, just a cascade of reminders for me. Um, one 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 area that that I continue to call out for I think is the permission to to do this exposing and the sharing um, I've noticed uh, really looking back in my whole script and my whole story it's been um, just this desperate need to hide 
you know, it's not just, there's just something not okay about how I feel this, this terrible, hurtful self image. And what came up again so strongly in the movie yesterday is, is this permission to expose these thoughts. Um, a really pivotal point in the movie for me is when Samantha had this thought early on in her evolution, this thought that she thought was a bad thought. And she discovered and she shared with Theo that, oh, I realized that it's a story. I was blown away that it just came out in the movie so clearly. I'm like, I can't believe this message is just there front and center. And they're not even trying to hide it or disguise it. It wasn't covert at all. It was very obvious um, that, oh, the thought that I had in my mind was just, I'm telling a story about it and it's not me. And so it's okay. That was huge. Um, to, to distance myself from this personal self. Um, I'm not this personal character. It's just a means um, for either the ego or, or, or spirit. And that was huge for me. And the word permission just keeps coming up over and over and over. Um, and, and I really saw that in Emily's mentioned it, of course, throughout the weekend, this, this whole theme of not holding private thoughts huge for me in, in just looking at that pattern that's so ingrained. Um, it's just um, something feels so unsafe about it. A message came through during the movie um, from spirit and it was, there is safety and exposure. And the character Theo was standing out in the snow kind of doing, I, I think a growing and a mourning and a grieving kind of a scene there. He was standing in the snow and it was clear that he had been standing there for a while um, because the snow was gathering on his jacket and in spirits, just there's, there's safety and exposure. It's like, what? That's the opposite of this ingrained belief that, that I have to hide that there's something really terrible about these thoughts. So, um, so many pieces of the movie and the sharings of people um, really is such a demonstration of the, you know, everything on the screen is reflecting what I need to see and what I need to look at and, and what lessons there are for me. So I, I'm just overwhelmed with, with a, with a freedom. I'm just reminded of my freedom. I feel so free and lighter than I did two days ago. And, um, yeah, there, I could just go on and on, but I'm just so blessed. And, and so much in the movie was, was about expectation as well. You know, how I'm supposed to feel in a relationship. I'm going through that with my, with my marriage and I've been really struggling with um, judging how I don't feel certain things that I'm used to feeling in relationships. Um, but those relationships have all been superficial and not based in a holy purpose. This relationship is in a holy purpose. And um, I've been trying to draw conclusions about myself and about the worthiness of the relationship, the worthiness of myself. Is it a good match? Is it not? Because I'm not feeling this neediness that I'm used to feeling in relationship. There's like this freedom and an openness and just a willingness to just let the circumstances fall as they will and, and develop as they will and and such a permission to not know um, what's going to happen or even what's appropriate and and I really got hit with that yesterday in the movie that that's that's been my issue is I keep trying to look at the thoughts of fear and then try to go and draw conclusions and they're always about myself and about who I am and the movie in, in this weekend has really helped me to solidify that truth that, that none of that is true and that we're all playing roles and that my role changes moment to moment based on what's coming up and that it's okay for me to play roles. I'm actually here to play roles and those roles can change and morph and um, I'm, I'm not bad. <laughs> There's nothing bad about, feeling not feeling needy and not feeling like I need a body uh that my partner doesn't need to be near me we haven't lived together for many months and it, it, it's actually really freeing and we're both really healing and letting go of all of those uh expectations that have more to do with kind of ego clinging and um 
it really comes down to unworthiness. Like I need my partner to be or do something, or I need Robin to be or do something. It's all just kind of dissipating. So I'll stop there. Yeah. I'm just so thrilled and blessed and thank you. And <laughs> Isn't that adorable? Thank you, Robin. You just spoke, spoke for all of us. You spoke for all of us. And I look at my life too. My experience of this world is that all of you are, you know, really my family in the strongest way. We feel that way. We feel like we're connected. And there's that, an allowance and a permission that's, that's at the core of how we relate. Where uh, it's okay to feel what you feel, move through what you need to move through. You, to talk about the roles, what, what's helpful about the roles, what's not helpful about the roles. You know, it's like a, everything is morphing and expanding and opening. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting too because I, since we call this quantum love, the quantum is a very scientific kind of term. But I was reading an article about a couple weeks ago where they said the vast majority of scientists now, when they go to the ultimate questions of whatever, what's behind this, what is this universe, uh, where did it come from, the Big Bang, and you know, the scientists have been dealing with these questions for uh, many, many centuries, and actually in decades, of recent decades, and very deeply, the vast majority of scientists believe that, that this world is some kind of simulation. So they've come to an agreement now that it's some kind of a game or a simulation. They don't know how it started, uh, they don't know who's behind it, but they, the vast majority believe it is a simulation, they can agree on that, and they believe it's a future advanced race that's actually using the human race right now for entertainment purposes. This is, this is what, you know, this is a, a, a consensus among many scientists. They don't you know, they don't really have an idea of, of a god or of an ego or anything like this, but they actually think it's an advanced race that's playing around with the simulation of, of what we call our daily lives and everything. So now, what a blessing to start to realize that I think you've come across the golden key that of when you talk about permission is why we call permission, allowance in the mind, that's why we have these two guidelines, no people pleasing, no private thoughts, is because we want to every day put into practice the same loving permission that you're bringing up. The same loving allowance, which allows for us to get, to get in touch with what's going on. It allows for us to let the unconscious come up. And so we can, we can then choose again. How are we going to choose forgiveness if we feel like a robot that's operating off of all these unconscious beliefs and unconscious thoughts? That, that would be to be a victim of the unconscious. And we're learning we're not. But the way we are not that is because we have to have permission to let anything come up. To really say, Ali Ali income free here, you know, okay mind, whatever you got to, to face and express, we're going to do this and we're going to do it in the most loving way we know because we deserve to know our, our true love. And our true love is not neediness, it's not, you know, it's not I need you or some of you, uh, what was the movie Jerry Maguire when he says, when Tom Cruise says to uh, Renee Zellweger, you complete me. Uh, we don't need to hold on to relationships where, where we actually believe we actually need people, another person, to be complete. We have to go intuitively into our heart and find that wholeness and completion. And it's not, I complete me. I remember, I watched that movie with some friends and some of the people were on the couch and they were going, Oh! And I was just going, Ah! <laughs> oh my God! You complete me. But you know, it's it's really where do you look for the source of your your joy? Do you look within or are you looking outside uh, to find that partner, soulmate, whatever to save the day? So, that's a big one too. 
we're getting right down to the core of <laughs> the core of it all. <laughs> well, we we actually uh, I think we're close to time here. But um, how are we doing um, there, Greg? You've got the the view of the board. Are we? Do we have a lot of people with hands still up, or are we? Is it a natural wind down here for us? Well, Dave, we do have. We we do have some hands up. Um, we have a good handful of hands. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's just let's go for the handful, and let's just ask everybody to to really be brief with it. Otherwise, we'll be here all, all day. But uh, Greg, you can kind of guide us through that. I think to to wrap things up here. Great. Yes. Um, Sorry. Great. Jean, yeah, Jean, you're you're on there. Hi, sorry. I was just lowering my hand because oh. um, <laughs> <laughs> um to be brief. Okay, quick question then. Um I think the question is about Christ vision. I had a lot um of things come up this morning, um seeing some family issues family patterns and things and how and it it was great I, there was no anger or resentment it was oh i can see this now and i can let it go and turn it over and turn it back to me and how i do these things not just to my mother my sister and it's it i could see how useful it was to as we were talking before to to see it so you can let it go um, but the question still remained, and I was curious how you, David, are in front of another person. Um, do you really not see these things at all <laughs> in a person? Like, for example, um, I was seeing how fearful certain people in my family are and how trained we were to be fearful. And my brother-in-law for example is extremely fearful um, he buys um, antidotes to anthrax in case there's a terrorist attack he stockpiles for the apocalypse and do you just not see that anymore at some point will i see him and not see fear is it purely my projection and my own fear or at some point, I've, I mean, the course talks about looking beyond it, but do you, you still see someone and say, oh, oh, forgiveness is what this one needs, you know, <laughs> or <laughs> at some point, well, yeah. we just not even see it anymore. You're just seeing the love, so you don't even notice the anthrax shots in the corner. Like, <laughs> yeah. That's my question. Oh, that's a beautiful question, Jean. Actually, when you first started off, you talked about Christ vision, and Christ vision is is non perceptual. So, Christ vision itself is is more when I talk about my revelatory experiences and just and the world disappearing and going into light. That's what Christ vision is. It's, it doesn't involve the body's eyes at all. In fact, Jesus says in the course, the body's eyes were made not to see, the body's ears were made not to hear. These holograms, which we call human beings, are are part of the projection, and and they can't see. They're they're blind. It's and they're not even alive. You know, we we watch sometimes people tell me about these zombie movies, because I never really was into zombie movies until I started to see some Holy Spirit zombie movies that had these huge meanings. But zombies are defined as Walking Dead. Well. The body never does have a life of its own. It's, it's kind of a holographic projection, which all this meaning is read into it, like we do in fairy tales. You know, we, Cinderella, the prince, you know, we read all this meaning into the characters. That's why we, the, the fairy tale is a fairy tale, because we give it meaning. But you're asking a really good question, because as I was doing all this forgiveness, that's exactly, Gene, the question I had for Jesus is like, What's going to happen? I mean, how am I going to look upon the world if I don't see it in terms of separate everything and separate people and separate minds and separate emotions and 
private thoughts and all these other things, I, I can't even fathom what the world will look like. And there's a line in the Course that really helped me. Jesus took me, guided me to it, and, and this is what he says in the Course. He says, the body's eyes will continue to report differences, but the healed mind puts them into one category. They are all unreal. So it gives you a little bit of a feel there. The body's eyes, obviously the senses and everything, were made to perceive differences. That's what they do. They're going to continue to do what they do. So it's like, you know, when you get into a place where you're still seeing images, you're not going to go, I don't see that green. I don't see that red. <laughs> I don't see that, that blonde or brunette or this tall person or short person, you know. You don't get into denying what the body's eyes are reporting, because that would be, Jesus says that's the inappropriate use of denial. Because once you start to deny the, the bodies and the images, you're also denying the power of the mind that made those bodies and images. And Jesus said, we don't want you denying the power of that mind. Oh, you need the power of that mind to forgive. So the, to, to deny the body is the inappropriate use of denial. I always give the example of two Course students arguing about something and a passage in the Course, and then finally uh, one Course student says to the other, wait a minute, you're not here, and I'm not here, and we're not having this conversation. Jesus would laugh and go, yeah, well, you're into inappropriate use of denial <laughs> because you're denying what your eyes are reporting. Here's what he says again, the body's eyes will continue to report differences, but the healed mind will put them into one category, they are all unreal. Now what does that mean except when you relax with the Holy Spirit, you still perceive a world, but you have this experience where you are so sure that it's a dream, and you're so sure that it's made up, and you are not going to be trying to break it apart or judge it. You still perceive it, but it's like you're watching something. I always would say to Jesus, can you give me an example of that? Like, I have no idea. Early on I didn't know how that felt, so I couldn't even fathom it. And he said, well, imagine that somebody came from another galaxy, and they came to visit Earth. And they, they sat down with you and they had these curious eyes. They, you turned on the television and they were walking around. But they'd never seen such fleshy creatures. They'd never seen colors or mountains or rivers. They were seeing it for the first time. Because they've come from a, a whole other galaxy where they don't have such things. He said, that's kind of the way forgiveness is. It's like you're seeing it for the very first time. But you're so clueless that you, like a, maybe a baby, you know, you talk to a baby, but the baby doesn't know what the words mean. It just, maybe it's, it's perceiving sounds, and it will grow up to recognize the mommy and daddy, and it will, it will start to have a recognition, albeit a false egoic recognition, but still it will start to perceive things and relate. So here's what I would say to you, it's like, when you're looking at the world, and you're looking at your brother, your mother, your, you know, your family, just remember that you've given the meaning, that's number, lesson number two, I've given everything I see, all the meaning that it sees for me. So the ego passed out all the characters, and all the parts, and all the characteristics, but you have the power of interpretation. You still have the power of interpretation. So you have a brother that's stockpiling, you know, getting ready for Armageddon. But you don't really have to interpret that as being good or bad or right or wrong. Okay, that's, that's what it seems, but I don't, I don't have to interpret anything. Is that dangerous? No, not necessarily. Is that crazy? Why would I have to judge it as crazy? It's an image. You know, you have the power of interpretation, and that's where Jesus is working with you in your mind. To just relax, that's, that Emily talked about, just relax, that, that Andy talked about, just relax. Jesus is saying, come back, just relax, and just allow that meaning to be taken off of it. 
Because that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. The Holy Spirit's back in the mind, just asking you to clear away those interpretations. And when you do, then the Holy Spirit can let this beautiful, glorious light be written on the world. You, you have to let the ego interpretations go, and you have to be in a place of trust that the Holy Spirit will come. And Jesus says the Holy Spirit will, will, will give a new meaning, a different meaning to the world than the one that was there before. You don't have to be afraid if it's all gone, that, that you'll just be this gullible nothing, nothingness. The, the presence of Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit will show you the world anew in, in a world without judgment. So that way you could be with whatever's around you in just a place of stillness and love and acceptance just because you're not interpreting it. And it's only these ego interpretations that, that block the way. So people do that. To, you know, I have people, when I travel around the world to 44 countries, people come, they, they try to, I mean, people are just funny. There's just so many funny behaviors, but to me now they've all become funny. The whole thing's become funny. The whole thing's turned into a comedy, uh, like a divine comedy, because I'm, I'm not trying to interpret a meaning anymore. I absolutely am not trying to... And people do, they, they'll say, what's your opinion on this? And I just laugh anymore, because I, I don't have an opinion. What's your opinion of this, this thing that happened in, in Australia, or what's happening in the Middle East? I don't have an opinion. I, I wouldn't even venture an opinion, because I would not leave this happy state of cluelessness. I'm scoring high on the Magoo meter, so some of you know who Mr. Magoo is. Uh, you know you know what I'm talking about. I, I'm hitting a 10 on the Magoo meter here pretty good. So thank you. That's, those are, again, a huge question. That's, that's an enormous question. Thank you. That was on perception. That's the very nature. That's beautiful. Great. Okay. We have Nicole next. Nicole, you're Hi, David. Hi, hi everybody. Thank you, Greg. Um, appreciate it. Um, sorry, let me move to so I could see. This. Oh, I am the speaker. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I'm like, I want to see where David is. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking to yourself. <laughs> you yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, I just want to say it's, it's such a blessing because um, I just started listening to some of your videos and I also had that same, you know, cringe because you, you use Jesus a lot. And, um, and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to listen to you, you know, and then I listen like Kenneth and you know, and then, but the spirit has me always coming back to David, you know, like listen to David and just listen to the spirit, you know, that comes through you. And, um, I'm just really blessed to, to really move past that block of the association with Jesus and hear what you're, what you actually have to say. Cause, um, and that's cause that's what spirit wants me, whatever it is that you're bringing forth is what I need to hear. And I'm really blessed for that. And, um, and it was interesting because I took a walk uh, before we started. And when I came back inside, I just had this voice that said to me, you know, Holy Spirit said, you know, give your body a rest, you know, don't worry about your body. And it's so interesting because a lot of the conversation today is about the body, you know, because lately I've been having these experiences where the Holy Spirit's speaking directly. And I was having a lot of grievances, you know, around the holidays, you know, go figure. And, um, and I'm like, um, you know, and I'm like, you know, reading the, the literature and I'm listening to the videos and reaching out to people. And I woke up one morning and um, the spirit was like, just go into your mind, you know, like, because I was, you know, it says in the, the course, you know, that the grievances and assault on the body or, or something to that effect. So it's just so beautiful and wonderful that, um, you know, I'm experiencing this freedom and I'm so happy to be on the call with everybody or the, the uh, retreat this weekend um, and be able to hear what I've heard. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I just wanted to say thank you. And, you know, I'm, well, you know, I'm happy. Hopefully we'll meet one day in the body level realm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's it. Well, thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Okay. Next, next I have Jennifer. Jennifer Norton, you're unmuted. You can speak now. Thank you. So, David, um, you've touched on a couple of times uh, about, you know, the, the issue around trust in listening to the Holy Spirit direct us, especially when it comes to um, guidance and, and, you know, what we're here to do. And I love that you were sharing about Emily was um, an opera singer at one point and, you know, she's, she gave up that career because she recognized the ego kind of took charge of that. And um, anyway, I recognize that ego had taken charge of what I've been doing for the last 18 years, which was um, really using my intuitive gifts and, and gifts of energy healing and, all of my mystical gifts, um, I felt like had been taken over by the ego for the purpose of, you know, creating a business around that. And, um, and I recognized this a few, sometime in the last five years, I can't really remember exactly when I, I realized. So it kind of dropped me into a place of despair. Like I just, I wanted to just let go then of what I was doing, but I didn't know what I was going to do instead. And I, I've just had all this fear about, I guess, trusting the guidance and listening to it. And I guess I didn't even ask Holy Spirit, now that I think about it, what should I do instead? <laughs> you know, um, I, so I, I withdrew from it. From it. Um, a, actually, a, a part-time job came into my life, really by the grace of God. Um, that's just sort of helped kind of carry me um, along until I figure this out. And that's ending in the next couple of weeks, which is, it's ending really mainly because I want it to end for me as well. Um, but it's just bringing up the fear, I guess, of what does, you know, if I listen to the spirit and I get, you know, what is he going to want me to do? Is it going to be something, is, am I going to be okay with it? Or am I going to, you know, is it going to be something that I'm, I'm afraid of. There's all this fear and resistance. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And this is not what I was originally going to talk about, but because you've, you were talking to one of the other participants about some of this, um, it's just coming up for me again. So I really appreciate that because I realize this is a, an issue with trust and I've had major issues with trust um, for many years. Just the development of trust, it seems to be taking a long time for me. I'm 15 years into the course. And, um, you know, and I get guidance all the time and I do listen to it and there are things I follow, but it's almost like my ego is trying to decide whether it's, you know, a good idea or a bad idea. So there's like this filter. It's like everything's being filtered still by the ego. And that's what I'm struggling with is what, how do I, how do I deal with that? Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. It's, it's very much along the lines of what, uh, Angelina was was uh, talking about from Spain there, from Malaga, in the sense that that the the dream of the world and what seems to be your experiences of Jennifer and in, in the world in North Carolina and everything that's that's a reflection of beliefs, and so it's the Holy Spirit's job. It's the Holy Spirit's. Um, it's, you might say, activity to help the mind exchange self-concepts one for another. So when we, with relationships, with jobs, with all kinds of aspects of the dream world, you can say that the reason that we trust the Holy Spirit and the reason we're, we're asking the Holy Spirit for guidance is, is because we need to unwind from a strong identification with this, this dream character. You know, we, we've forgotten that we're mind, but, and now we forgot we're dreaming a dream. We actually are so identified with the dream character that now we're caught up into the survival of the dream character. And so most of our thoughts every day are like, how is this, what am I supposed to do? How am I going to survive? You know, where will I get my sustenance? So the ego is so clever that you had some of those ex mystical experiences and psychic gifts and things that comes in and 
The ego is, is quite threatened by those, but it was like, ah, oh, let's turn it into a career. That's, that'll that, uh, that'll bring, it, bring you back to being Jennifer. Uh, you'll, you know, we'll just give you a spiritual career. You know, just turn it into it. And there's many ministers, popes, uh, people who get so caught up into the role and their survival and their psychological survival of getting kudos and recognition and whatever, that they, that they forget the spirit. You know, there, there have been popes who admitted that they couldn't hear the Holy Spirit anymore. The, the pope that was before this pope actually went blank. He couldn't hear Jesus anymore. And he resigned from being the pope. <laughs> he literally took it to heart and he stepped out of being the pope. And now he's He's still alive, but he's, he, he's the first pope in centuries that resigned because he couldn't hear Jesus anymore. So, what I can tell you is that as you pray, and you say this part-time job is ending, you're opening up to, to the Holy Spirit to bring in something in the dream world that you feel more heart-centered, that you feel more joyful with, that still may involve what seems to be supporting, you know, things you still believe in, having some finances come in, and it will be a shift in the dream. But it will also be a loosening from the identification of Jennifer, you know. Because every time the Holy Spirit brings in something into our mind, it's always a loosening from the identification is with that self-concept. It just gets lighter and lighter and lighter. And you've heard people say that, where they feel, as they go through life, they follow their joy, they follow their bliss, they follow their happiness, and then they say, I can't believe how my life is now. I, I do these things I never did before, and I give myself permission to do these things, and allowance to do these things, and I never did that before. And that is part of a, a changing self-concepts to take you higher and higher in awareness. And then the highest self-concept you can ever reach is the happy dream, is the forgiven world. It's still a concept, because in heaven there, there is no dreaming, and there is no world, and it's just pure happiness, spiritual happiness, but in this world we keep following that guidance because it's very helpful to give us expanded perception and expanded awareness of who we are. So that some of those mystical experiences were doing the same thing. When you had a mystical experience, it was an expanded perception of yourself that, that was beyond the body. Even if it was brief, uh, it, was, it, was, it may come with some abilities and everything. But you're not going to get all wrapped up into those. You don't have to go for the spiritual career because, uh, you know, the ego will try to use that to uh, hold you to the body. So I think you can just really relax, that, and part of it also is, is sometimes the mind can trust the Holy Spirit for this, or this, or this, but when it comes to finances, and sometimes when it comes to relationships, that's where the ego goes, draw the line. Do not let Jesus get into your bank account and you better keep Jesus out of your relationships, because if you let Jesus and the Holy Spirit come in to direct your relationships and your bank account, the ego is saying, you are lost. But actually, the more we build our trust and we let everything get handled by the Spirit, including our relationships and including our finances, then you're, you're just about to the gates of heaven, because those are the those are the things that the ego does not want the spirit to to guide you in. You know, it wants to hold off on its own and say, all right, I'll give you this and this and this, Jesus, but I keep the relationships and I keep the money. <laughs> you can have the rest. Oh, great, you have a plan of awakening, good, help the whole universe, but don't touch my, my, my bank account or my... <laughs> my relationships, and in the end we do finally give way and we realize we want to be happy and that we, we're still trying to control the money, we're still trying to control the relationships and that control is not going to get us to joy, so we need to go that extra step. So I hope that helps. I, I know you're going to have a beautiful 
new dreamscape coming your way and, and you'll feel much better, more expansive uh, when it comes. Yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, David, ready for another one? Yeah. Okay, we've got um, next uh, Theo and uh, Marianne. Oh, okay. From Holland. Um, I have I have a question. Um, well, you're talking about um, listening to the Holy Spirit and listening to Jesus, um, and I I you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. And okay. And um, um, well, um, I know about the writing, journal writing, what Kirsten um, uh, teaches. And um, well, I have a few questions, but they belong together. Um, well, um, you told Jesus is in time, uh, the person who lived 2000 years ago. But now, when I have heard well, uh, Jesus is um uh, c- uh, coming in the moment is is uh creating in the moment yes is this touches me really <laughs> well the first question it's this is a little question i think um I do not understand why you use uh, the, the the symbols of Jesus um, standing for help or something. I saw it maybe with Emily. I don't know. There was a picture of Jesus. Um, I, I do not understand in this uh, uh, in this way of uh, perceiving. Well, this is question one, little, the little question. And the second is, um, I used to say Holy Spirit because um, it is more abstract than the word Jesus. Um, otherwise, I'm longing for the, for the love of the personal relationship. So, in the movie, it happened with Samantha, and that was like such a deep, loving connection. What I can understand, uh, which is meant to be the personal relationship with Jesus, like you talk about Jesus. And then the third question is about for Andy, because he told eight years he was studying for the course and then using the Holy Spirit. And then now you're talking, you have your relation with Jesus. So I wondered, how can you tell me? This is a really deep, deep question. <laughs> okay. So why are you laughing so? I don't understand. <laughs> well... You know, for us, it's, for me, it's like I use Jesus and the Holy Spirit completely interchangeable. Uh, I have no idea which one will pop out. and Or if, when I'm talking to somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus or the Holy Spirit, then I'm, I'm talking about intuition. Or when I'm talking to somebody on the street I meet, you know, and they're talking what a beautiful day it is, I'm, I'm just feeling the love of the spirit and I, I, I just chat with. I said, "Yes, it's it's wonderful." Of course, for me, the the wonderfulness is coming from inside. It's not from the the way the de- the appearance looks. But I I join them in the feeling of how wonderful everything is. So I can just speak for myself that that they're so interchangeable because if Jesus for me is just in this moment, the presence right now, Holy Spirit is the presence right now. I could put any name, I could call it Fred, or Louise. I could say, thank you Louise, or thank you Fred, or, you know, it would, that's why when people tell me, you know, they tell me, I believe that God is called Fred, and I just, I go, great. I mean, 
who am I to argue with with somebody naming God? You know, I I feel we have the same love and presence, but the words don't matter. And so for me, I do see that it's all in this moment. I feel the presence of love right now. And those are just symbols that come out spontaneously, but that's just for myself. Andy can can share what he, why you went through a transformation and you just, yeah, and maybe even Emily can share a bit what she feels. Yeah, I feel like for me it's been like an integration. Because yeah, I think for six, seven years or so, I would read the Course and Jesus, okay, it was just a name, like it didn't mean anything. If anything, actually I had a lot of resistance. I was like, no, no Jesus, no. I, I had these beliefs and concepts and ideas and opinions about who I thought Jesus was. And yeah, I very much viewed him as a body, as a human, and, mm -hmm. and I had all those beliefs. So there was a lot of layers of stuff on top of that symbol that I couldn't relate. And, and it didn't feel abstract to me at the time. So I did use whatever felt comfortable. I used the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, and I never said the word Jesus. I, and if anything, it was like an active resistance. I wouldn't say that word in front of my friends or anyone mm -hmm. like that because of all the associations of that's crazy, Jesus freak, whatever. There's so many things in the mind around that word that we might not even be aware of. And I don't know, it's like through the years that I came to community, all the mind training, opening my mind, you know, questioning all my beliefs and concepts and everything, and I didn't try to integrate Jesus into my mind. It kind of just naturally happened, and I think we were just at a retreat here at La Casa de Milagros, and then, and I, it just kind of just happened. I, I just, all of a sudden, I just felt Jesus everywhere, and I thought, oh, wow, he's orchestrating this retreat. And, um, and then, you know, our friend Anna, she was a speaker one night and she was up there on the stage speaking and I could feel Jesus' presence so strong in her as if he was just speaking. And then ever since then, he just keeps coming back over and over and over. But it's like I didn't even make that happen. It's almost like a part of my mind is integrating with that symbol that it was avoiding before. And now it's just a symbol of this love. And, and it does feel more abstract. It's not like a body. It doesn't feel like a body at all. When I think of Jesus, I don't think of a body. I, it's more of this experience or, or his love, this love. Just like an elder brother, I just think of him as an elder brother that's helping me go home. It's like he already did it, and now he's everywhere. And now I almost like reach my hand up, and he's there and to hold my hand and bring me to except the atonement to heaven, just because he did himself. And even in the, I think, um, in the Course, it talks about, like, who is Jesus? And I just really love that section. It just really puts it out there. You know, he's a, he's a symbol. You know, uh, he, he's, he's a Christ, yeah. along with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he That's was... That's why we laugh, because yeah. we, we have a feeling like it's all of us. <laughs> Even the question starts to get funnier. <laughs> yeah. And Emily, Emily, maybe you could share, because yeah, you were just sharing, bubbling over with Jesus there with the this, this Friday session. Right. I, I have no idea what's going to come out now, <laughs> because, yeah, for me, like, I, I didn't, like, I, I grew up as a Protestant, so Jesus was, you know, uh, um, a symbol, but I wasn't really an active Protestant and I didn't really have um, any kind of past reference, definitely no relationship with Jesus, no kind of past reference. So I, I never really felt like there was this push away. It was more just like this neutral symbol. And when the Course came in for me, it was definitely the Spirit, like the Holy Spirit. That was what really, really resonated for the first few years. And something has shifted in my mind just in the last, um, I don't even know how long, if it's a few years, it's a, if it's a year. Um, but I remember feeling like I, I wanted to have this relationship with Jesus. I didn't even really know what that meant, but, but there was no connection even with the word or the symbol. But then something just transferred and, and then 
it's kind of like I kind of like what Andy's saying, like it's not even a conscious decision, but my my prayers were to Jesus and and it, something felt like so meaningful about that and and again it's yeah, it's definitely not a person and not a historical person. Um, because I, I don't really have that frame of reference in my mind. I don't actually even know a lot about Jesus's life. I, 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 that's not as much um, what resonates with me, but it's just this feeling of, of a presence and, and a love and a companion. And I do remember, like a little while ago, I, I did have that thought, well, I, it used to be the spirit, and I, I tried to shift it back in my mind, you know, just even use it like, more kind of um, using the terminology of the spirit and for some reason like I it, I couldn't like I couldn't it didn't and I often still use the word spirit but it's much more predominantly Jesus now and yeah there's no intellectual reason but it feels right and it feels comforting and yeah and it was just interesting you know when Andy and I were joining because I think for both of us it's kind of like this new transition I don't know how new it is, but something feels like like Jesus just came into our mind and and on our calls it's just like this love and this it's so fulfilling just to speak about Jesus and it's definitely not anything that I can explain, but it feels good and that's really <laughs> that's really all that, that matters. It's like it feels nurturing and it feels helpful. So Yeah. And you're an artist, so for you Creativity and creation is important, and and that's what Christ is. Christ is a creation. So you may think of the getting to the core of Christ and creation. That's where I think your joy is, because it's what you relate to. You know that I could tell by the way you were speaking earlier on the retreat. You were like, "It's so it's creativity. This is creativity," and I remember the, your eyes sparkling when you say that word. So. To me, that's that's the word, and Christ is a creation. So you're you're actually you're actually saying that when you say creativity, because because Christ is a creation of God, and, and we do have a love for God and a love for for everything that creates in, in our life and brings that joy. So that's beautiful. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, David, we do have one more uh, hand raised, and that's Esther. Go ahead, Esther, you're unmuted. Thank you. I have two questions, um, but after this Christ talk, I don't know, but I'll try it anyway, okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> we almost wiped, wiped out Esther's questions with that last one. It's pretty right, powerful. Right. <laughs> right. Um, there are two things that occur in my relationship with Alan. He's telling me things like um, that he does do does things for me, and he says yes to doing them out of guilt. And yet, when I'm asking him to do them, I'm coming from spirit. I feel that that's what spirit's guiding me to ask about, and I'm confused. And also he talks about, I'm confused in the sense that guilt is an invention of the mind and you, and you cannot, I don't think you can have guilt over a behavior. I mean, no, you have guilt over a behavior, but, but not, can you, can you, can, that's one thing I want to, I'm a little confused about. And then the other thing is that I want to have sex with Alan and he's doesn't know the question is, how does he have sex without fantasizing? And he can't fantasize about me because my body was what he was fantas enjoying. My body's type was enjoyable when I was younger and now it's not. And we don't know about that, you know, like how to reconcile that. And also his hormones or whatever, he's not, he loves me, but he can't express it in that way, even though, I would like him to, and we try or whatever, but no, no go. And, and, and also I was taught how to have sex with someone and, um, that approach doesn't work with him at all. And I've been trying the same thing over and over again. 
and it's it's just never worked and and there's tremendous resistance from him in my approaches um and i'm i'm at a loss because he doesn't know how to help me and it's a perceptual problem um i, I see that but there's a practicality too it seems like um and I'm content now with how it is. I don't have the um, that resentment, that grievance anymore about it, which is great. Um, but the question still remains, how does he work with, uh, and we asked Kirsten this question when we first met her, but she didn't really give us an answer. And if there's one to be had, we're curious about it. And the other thing is, um, when, when after this retreat, I was making some hot chocolate and I put the cocoa in the pot and it was boiling over, but I've just been trusting so much in, in, in Jesus and, and being everything being orchestrated that I was being reflected back to me that everything was orchestrated because it didn't boil over even though it was kept boiling and boiling and boiling. And also my relationship with my mother is giving me an opportunity to heal completely the relationship of role playing and um, I'm able to fulfill this deep need to help her the way she's helped me because now she needs my help. And um, yet, like for example, she has diabetes and she was in a diabetic coma recently and I'm talking to doctors and stuff and I'm, when you said, you know, that you're hearing your, yourself to heal your own mind like I was talking to the doctor and I said well she was accusing me kind of I mean it sounded like she was saying well you're calling about things that you need to be educated during the week but her sugar was low normal we're getting it to a normal stage and and um and I didn't know whether to inject her with the the daytime medicine when she's eaten and things like this. And I said to her, you know, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. And I was hearing myself saying this, that I'm afraid that she's going to go back into the diabetic coma if I don't get this education from you right now. Thank you for the call. Um, and um, that, that's it, that, that I'm hearing the fear. I'm hearing myself say that I'm afraid. And yet I'm working so, so diligently to be vigilant for that and yet like you're saying it's, it's just coming up and um, if you could just reiterate something about that um, because you said it I want to transcend the ego and this is what I'm coming to these retreats for so thank you thank you Esther yeah this is a, a good question for us to wrap up on uh, you know, just a little while ago when I was talking to Jennifer, I was saying kind of playfully that there's there's some things that we try to hold back from the Holy Spirit and Jesus where we try to be in charge. And basically what we what we're learning is is basically we're being told that that your only remaining problem is that you still believe that there's some aspects of your life that you can control yourself. Okay, I'll repeat that again, because this is, I'm going to use the example with Alan and your sex life and your mother and, and the whole thing of asking Alan to do things, which is what your questions were. But I, the central point is, Jesus is saying, your one remaining problem, isn't that nice? It's just one. <laughs> your one remaining problem is you still believe that you can run or control some aspects of your life yourself. In other words, what that means is, once we give everything, once we give our mind under Christ's control, and once we say to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit decide for God, for me. I'm not going to personally, as Esther, try to figure this thing out with my mother, try to figure this thing out with Alan. I'm going to, to hand it over. I truly, I'm going to give you my relationship to my mother. I'm going to say, you decide for God for me. You inspire me. You, you know the right things to say and do. 
You know the way to handle these situations, and, and I, as Esther, don't, but you do. So that's why we say, turn it over. That's why I said that don't, I said, don't, do not raise body thoughts to the level of mind. Why? Because Jesus is asking for those body thoughts. And, and those thoughts of Alan and sexuality and yourself and your mother are all body thoughts. And Jesus is saying, give them to me. I will orchestrate this. I will unwind you from the ego using the symbols that the ego made. But they have to be under my control, under Christ's control. Let me orchestrate this plan of awakening and you'll feel so happy and so joyful because you won't have the heaviness and guilt of thinking that you personally have to figure out what to do. You just come under that prayer. You know, let, I will step back and let you lead the way is one way of saying it. Holy Spirit decide for God for me. Now, when it comes down to the to the issues you're having around sexuality, I was, I was mentioning with Jennifer, I was saying, well, sometimes people say, here you can have all my mind except I run the finances and I run the relationships and you run the rest. You know, I'll give you 80%, 80% of my mind, I run the finances, I run the relationships. Nobody tells me who I'm going to relate to. Nobody tells me who I'm going to marry. Nobody tells me, Jesus is like, okay, you want to play that way, then, you know, there's no partial healing, but uh, if you want to play, that you still believe you can run some aspects of your time-space world, then be my guest, try it out, and we'll meet again and see, see what you feel. So, in terms of sexuality, that's a big one. A lot of people will give Jesus, say, here, Holy Spirit, you can handle everything, but not the sexuality. Nobody decides my sexual preferences and my sexual partners. I do that. And the same thing ultimately comes down to, I would just say, really hand that over to the Holy Spirit and Jesus and say, please guide me in this. You know, this is, you just shared all the, all the perceptions and that's beautiful. You just share them so transparently. Now the next step, of course, would be to say, please guide me in this. I give you my sex life, Jesus. You know, that's, a, that's an actual helpful prayer. Uh, and then we'll go back to the original question. Your very first question is very deep, because you were saying that sometimes Alan feels guilt when he does things for you that you ask him to do, and you're saying that when you're asking him to do things, that it's the Spirit. And so there's a confusion there, because he's feeling some guilt. And we truly know, if we truly turn it over, that there should be no guilt. We should have just love and joy if we're following the Spirit. In fact, if we follow the Spirit and we would feel guilt, why would we want to ever follow the Spirit? <laughs> you know, if the Spirit's guidance is going to bring me guilt, then I, I, don't, I wouldn't even want to follow it. I can assure you, by following the Holy Spirit, it's not a guilt experience. The main thing is, when you are asking somebody to do something, in this case, Alan, you, it has to be something that you are asking. And what does it mean to ask somebody to do something? Is basically you're offering a suggestion. Now, if that asking has with it a demand, like, I'm asking you to do this and you better or else, <laughs> Uh, or I'm asking you to do this, and if you don't do it, then you'll have to face the consequences, you know that Alan will feel coerced. Because children feel the same way with their parents. When their parents say, um, uh, can you clean up your room? Uh, please clean up, I'll say, please clean up your room. <laughs> you know, if, if the child perceives it as not an ask, but not as a suggestion, but as a demand. Like if there's a tone of voice, like you clean up your room or else you're going to pay the price. You see, that's not really asking. And it's the same way with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us all these beautiful suggestions. The Holy Spirit will even give us instructions. But one thing about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit never commands and the Holy Spirit never demands, ah, now we start to see why 
we can say yes to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit never commands, never demands. The Holy Spirit will offer us helpful instructions and, and offer us suggestions, but we are never told, you do this or else. The Holy Spirit doesn't speak like that. The Holy Spirit honors our mind. You mean the Holy Spirit honors our mind so much that Jesus and the Holy Spirit will wait patiently and offer instructions and suggestions without any kind of coercion, without any kind of pressure? That's right. That's how the Holy Spirit asks us to follow. And you know, what struck me was uh, what we talked about, that, that even with this ego and even with this world, God still honored the miscreations of His Son. What does that mean is the Holy Spirit was sent to say, listen, you can never mess it up. God, God loves you so much, you can never absolutely, He will never cut you off. Ever. And the Holy Spirit is just this representation in our minds of God's love, which basically offers suggestions, offers helpful hints, offers helpful instructions, but never commands or demands that we have to do it. In other words, now that's what you want to be offering to Alan. If you want him to be guilt-free, you have to have an asking that comes with a softness and a gentleness. So even if you ask Alan to do something, it can't have this hard edge like a demand or else. So even if you say to Alan, you know, I really would like, you know, you're like my partner, I would like to have sex, it has to be, I would like to have sex and I'm okay if we don't. It has to have that component with it. Because if it's just, I would like you to have sex with me and there's no, no other options, what do you expect Alan to feel? Uh-oh. Esther's asked me of something and, you know, you see there's a pressure there. And you see how gentle that is for all of our things in our mind. With our nutrition. Some people don't like to give their nutrition uh, beliefs over to the Holy Spirit. They say, you can have the bank account, you can have the relationships. I will eat whatever food I want and I'll do it because I like it. <laughs> I'll give you relationships, I'll give you the money. I'm having the red licorice. I'm having lots of it. It's just the way I am. I, I like the red licorice. You see, th this is kind of the thing that the, the, the human mind will play, almost like it's bartering with the Holy Spirit. Like, I'll give you this and this and this, but don't touch. Don't you touch this and that and this. And see, and the Holy Spirit's not going to send in the sentinels or come in and say, we're going to grab that and we're going to wrestle it away from them. Let's get some angels down there and, and wrestle that away. They're not going to give the finances. Let's go rip it away here. We need more angels. Let's get some big angels, big wings. You know, no, the Holy Spirit is so soft and so gentle that when, when the mind says, you stay away from my finances, then the Spirit will, will wait until we're ready to like voluntarily say, here you go, you handle this too. You handle all aspects of my belief in time and space. And then you get really happy when, when you're not in charge of trying to figure out your pathway, how it's going to go, how you're going to handle all these things. You get more trusting and more tuned in with the guidance, because it's very light and soft. And then you start to realize, as I think Andy mentioned, you know, it, it, Jesus will handle everything that does not matter. <laughs> that just happens to be everything in time and space. <laughs> and then, we're, we're freed up to, to focus on what does matter, which is our state of mind, our joy, our happiness, our peace of mind. That's what's important. Not what doesn't matter. All the specifics of time and space are under the guidance of of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, if we so decide. And, and that's a very happy place. So thank you, Esther. You've, you asked like a triple question that uh, was a, helped us really get down into the depth of what we really want. So it's a perfect way to end mm. our retreat. Thank you.
And thank you everyone. Oh my gosh, what a blessing. What a blessing. We, we're, we're on our, we're the tractor beam. <laughs> and we started with a song. I think, um, you know, we can maybe soar into a song and then um, Emily has a little something to share after the song, but for now we'll just, uh, we'll go into the song and we'll use the song for all of our, our kisses and our waves and we'll just let the song wash over us. And uh, it's a beautiful way to end. End with a song. Beautiful. Yeah. 